share this lesson from Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The boy grew and stopped nursing. On the day he stopped nursing, Abraham prepared a huge banquet. Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing, the one Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham. So Sarah said to Abraham, send this servant away with her son. The servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son Isaac. This upset Abraham terribly because the boy was his son. God said to Abraham, don't be upset about the boy and your servant. Do everything Sarah tells you to do because your descendants will be traced through Isaac. But I will make of your servant's son a great nation too because he is also your descendant. Abraham got up early in the morning, took some bread and a flask of water, and gave it to Hagar. He put the boy in her shoulder sling and sent her away. She left and wandered through the de desert near Beersheba. Finally, the water in the flask ran out, and she put the boy down under one of the desert shrubs. She walked away from him about as far as a bow shot and sat down, telling herself, I can't bear to see the boy die. She sat at a distance, cried out in grief, and wept. God heard the boy's cries, and God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up, pick up the boy, and take him by the hand, because I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well. She went over, filled the water flask, and gave the boy a drink. God remained with the boy. He grew up, lived in the desert, and became an expert archer. He lived in the Paran Desert, and his mother found him an Egyptian wife. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. As some of you know, during this uh, summer season, I've been attempting to do a, a series. I was kind of inspired by my love for, for comic books and uh, um, superhero movies, those sorts of things, because they always tell you the backstory of everyone. And they tell you the story, whether that's true for both the, uh, uh, the hero or the villain. They give you the the backstory, so that you can know what's going on in their life. I saw a great quote as I was preparing this week. It's from a 20th century poet by the name of Muriel Ruckheiser. She writes, The universe is made of stories, not atoms. And I think that's a lot of truth to that. Because we, as the people of God, are a people made of stories. The stories we find in the Bible, the greatest set of backstories that exist, that tell us about us and what has made us who we are. Now, today's story could be one that's about enemies, maybe even villains, if you wanted to go that far. At least there are those who, well, seem to threaten the people of God, or some of the people of God. 
in some way. Those backstories about villains are extremely important in understanding how, how villains uh, or how heroes respond in, in comic books and, and, and the, the movies as well. One of my favorites, the Spider-Man series, his, his greatest nemesis is the Green Goblin. And the Green Goblin knows the secret identity of, of Spider-Man. But the thing is, the Green Go Spider-Man also knows the identity of the Green Goblin. And he happens to be his best friend's father. Which makes their battles epic in that, well, one is trying to kill the other, and the other is just trying to not kill his best friend's father. Ah, if you read the stories, if you watch the movies, you'll know that things kind of go awry. At least they seem to. But... In the end, knowing that story helps us understand the battle that takes place between the two. But when we read this story from Genesis today, it's difficult, isn't it, to really know who the enemy or the villain is? It's kind of hard to tell here. I mean, some would read it and say that Ishmael is somehow the villain, somehow the enemy. We think about his, his origin story, how Ishmael came to be. It's, you know, God sent the prom or gave the promise to Abram and, and Sarai that they would have children, and uh, nothing seemed to happen for a while, so Sarai gave her, her slave to Abraham. And, um, well, Abraham slept with her, and she bore them a son, Ishmael. And that's where Ishmael comes from. And some people, when they read this story, they, they, they see him as sort of the villain or the enemy here because he is not the child of the promise. That child is Isaac. In fact, isn't that exactly what happens when Sarah sees Ishmael? On the day they're throwing a great feast for Isaac in the story, Sarah sees Ishmael laughing. We don't know why he was laughing. Maybe he just learned why the chicken crossed the road. Who knows? We don't. But he was laughing, and, and Sarah took offense at this. And she decided Ishmael had to go. He was the enemy. He was the villain. He was the one who could usurp Isaac's place in the line. And so she goes to Abraham and says, guess what, Abraham? You've got to get rid of him. Get rid of who? Hagar and that, that boy of hers. Some read this part of the story, they see that Sarah sees Ishmael as kind of the enemy, and they think, okay, the real enemy here, the real enemy here is Sarah, right? I mean, because she's the one who's getting jealous about everything, who's getting worried about everything, trying to take matters into her own hands. So she must be the enemy in this story. It's not really Ishmael. He, he, he didn't do anything. Hagar just did what she was told. But Sarah. And then we read about Abraham. I love the line that is in, in the Bible about Abraham. It says, Abraham was very upset about these things. Or, these things troubled Abraham greatly, is what it says. Troubled him greatly? I mean, this is his son that Sarah is wanting him to send out into the desert. And he is just troubled greatly. I don't know how many of you would respond if you were told to, to send your son out into the desert, but send them away from you. But being troubled greatly would be kind of low on my list. Mad would be there. Uh, angrier than you know what would also be on the list. 
There would be all kinds of responses I, I would have, but it seems like Abraham just sat around and brooded because he was troubled greatly. He didn't have the guts, the nerve, to stand up to his wife, Sarah, and say, uh, no, I'm not going to do this. For whatever reason, Abraham accepted that he was going to have to do it, and he was troubled greatly by it. So maybe it's Abraham that's the enemy in the story. I'll choose your villain, folks. If you want it to be Ishmael, if you want it to be Sarah, if you want it to be Abraham, it, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. Personally, I like to choose Abraham. He's the one I can relate to. I mean, I like to think that he was sitting there thinking, happy wife, happy life, happy wife, happy life, happy wife, happy life. And, and, and facing this, this, this quandary, he just didn't know what to do about. But then God showed up again and said to Abraham, don't be worried about what Sarah's told you to do. Do everything she said. Because guess what? Isaac is where we're going to trace your ancestry. But Ishmael is your son too. And I'm going to make a great nation of him too. What God did in this, 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 this story of, of giving Abraham permission, sending out Hagar and Ishmael, and even protecting them in the desert, what God did was take every one of the enemies every one of the villains you could find in this story, and redeemed them all. Abraham, he gave permission for him to do. Sarah, God forgave her and let her remain as the woman whose name would be remembered as the mother of Isaac. And even Hagar and Ishmael, these two would become a great nation. So God took all the, the enemies, all the villains, made them special too. It's an interesting story about us, if you think about it. The real thing for us to remember is that in the midst of making villains and enemies, God will show up and make them special in God's story, too. Do you remember the passage that was read from Matthew about you know, Jesus coming to bring not peace but a sword, and there'll be division, and mother will be against daughter, and father will be against son, and the enemy will be found where? In your family. In your family. Today, we live in one of the worst times of division that I've ever seen, that I've ever even read about, since maybe our own civil war. It's scary the way we're fighting with each other these days. And it's not only something that we find in our culture, but it's, it's something that's, that's leaking and, and seeping into the walls of the church as well. It, it seems like people are no longer allowed to disagree. People are no longer allowed to to have an opinion. There's right and wrong. And no one wants to live in that messy middle where people disagree about things. It's terrifying if you think about it. 
We worry a lot about terrorists. <laughs> but I wonder if we aren't terrorizing our own selves in the midst of things. Have any of you ever heard of the book or the movie Blood Done Signed My Name? You may have heard, heard the song, but old, old gospel song by that name, but have you ever heard of the book or movie called that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's not a well-known. I highly recommend them both, both the book and the movie. Um, and they both tell a great story about uh, a little town in North Carolina that went through some terrible times in the 60s. Um, a young black man was accused of, of looking at or saying the wrong things to a woman a white woman there in town, and, and men got together and lynched this young black man. And then there was a trial of some sort, and the town was divided, even at the trial, and following the trial where the men were found not guilty of murdering this man, they hung from a tree. Riots broke out in the city. Burnt about half of the city down. It was a terrible, terrible time for that little city. The, the name of the city is important to me because it's Oxford, North Carolina. I served as a student pastor in Oxford, North Carolina for three years while I was attending Duke Divinity School lived there among the people, lived uh, right in the town, uh, probably actually just blocks over from where um, many of the tobacco warehouses had been burned down in the riots there. But you know the most fascinating thing about all of this? I did not learn about that lynching, that trial, or those riots until about five years after I left, or seven years after I left Oxford, North Carolina. Nobody talked about it while I was there. No one mentioned it. I would ask about certain buildings in the town. I'd be told certain things, but I'd never be told that that, burning, that building burnt in the riots. I'd ask about the metal tobacco warehouses that were surrounded the outskirts of the city. I was never told about the great wooden ones that existed before. That town done got dead silent over their past because they didn't know how to talk about right and wrong didn't know how to talk about race, <laughs> even 40 years later, they couldn't talk about it. My brothers and sisters, we live in a time where we are so, so divided that we better find a way of remembering that uh, we're not supposed to make people right and wrong. Because you know what happens when we make villains in our stories? God comes along and he takes care of them too. That's what we learn from Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac, right? God comes along and, and takes those ones we would make villains and makes them into heroes. Doesn't matter if they were, they were Abraham, if we see the villain as Abraham, Sarah, Ishmael, Hagar. It doesn't matter who we see. God blessed them all. Even though some would say they were right, and some would say the others were wrong, and this had to happen. Folks, we live in dangerous times 
both as a culture and as a church. So much fighting about both sides being so certain that they are right. Maybe we haven't learned the story of Abraham well enough yet. That's where God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to take care of the one you cast out. Keep that in mind as you get ready to, to, to cast out anyone from your family. Keep that in mind as you get ready to cast out anyone who's in your church. Keep that in mind as you get ready to, to cast out or cast off Anyone in your community. God's got God's eye on them, too. I hope we can learn from this great origin story or backstory about how we can treat our enemies, our villains. Perhaps we can treat them the same way God treats us. Amen? Would you pray with me? God, sometimes it's, it's so much easier to, to draw lines and divide rather than to stand on the line that is your love rather than to hang on the cross that is the sacrifice. It's so much easier just to divide. So give us that hope that we learn from Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Isaac, and Ishmael, that you have your eye on all of us. Where we would divide you're going to take care of things. Help us live our story, Lord. For this we pray in your name. And amen.